Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Bitcoin for Everybody. Uh, PRD, this is a recap of PRDV 151 for uh, sailor.org's uh, course. I'll put the link in the description below. Remember, this is a recap. There's been recaps for the four other units of the course, and we invite you to take the course. We invite you to join the discourse discussion forums. I'll make sure that I add all of those to the uh, chat and also to the comments down below. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Stefan to introduce our guests and get this going. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Mike. So yeah, my guests today, uh, well, we, we have Michael Saylor, uh, the creator and uh, founder of Saylor Academy himself, uh, and also obviously a very well-known Bitcoin advocate, as I'm sure many of you already know, uh, and Matt O'Dell, a friend of mine in the space, uh, uh, another Bitcoin podcaster. He's the co-host of Rabbit Hole Recap and also the host of Citadel Dispatch, and he's very well known as a Bitcoin and privacy advocate and also you know, a friend of mine. So uh, very... Uh, Pleased to be joined by my friends today. Um, and so today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the basics around how to get involved and how to get started with Bitcoin. So we're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin in practice. So I thought it might be good to start with Michael, if you could give some of your tips on how to get started with purchasing. Some, so let's say I've learned a little bit about Bitcoin and now I'm thinking, okay, I want to, I want to buy some. How do I, how do I go about, or how do I go about getting some Bitcoin? Well, I mean, I think you got a lot of choices. I, I would probably err on the side of, um, of picking the most convenient uh, Bitcoin um, application or exchange you can find in your jurisdiction. It depends on what country you're in. And if you buy, if you buy one on an exchange, make sure you can take the Bitcoin off the exchange to your private wallet. So, you, I mean, you could buy it through Fidelity and take it off the exchange, or you could take it off the exchange of Coinbase and I kind of like Square because you can buy it and also take it off the exchange. There are some Bitcoin uh, purchase routes that I won't name where you could buy the Bitcoin, but you can't take custody of the Bitcoin. So you're really just buying a Bitcoin derivative and you would be trapped with that custodian. I think that um, my first advice generally is, is uh, get yourself some Bitcoin. That's my first advice. And my second advice is when you get the Bitcoin, make sure you get it from a place that will like, let you switch custodians or take personal custody of it. And then after you do a little bit, then start to get educated and then you'll form opinions about where you want to hold it long term and how you want to hold it long term. And you'll have all your options available to you. Excellent. Uh, Matt, do you have anything to add there in terms of how to acquire Bitcoin? I mean, I think uh, Michael really nailed it on the head there. Uh, the The number one thing is 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 don't be afraid of it. You know, I think uh, people tend to get overwhelmed very easily, uh, and a very good way to start is to just get a little bit of Bitcoin, take custody of it yourself, and play around with it. Get comfortable with it. Send it around. You know, send it back to yourself. Maybe if you have a friend, you can send it between. Uh, and just get used to like the whole backup process that, that whole, the whole concepts around Bitcoin um, on the surface seem very, very overwhelming to people. But once you start to get used to it and get comfortable with it, it's a lot more approachable. Yeah. And so there's different ways to get involved. Another way is actually to earn Bitcoin. So do either of you guys have comments on how to go about doing that? I'll let Matt go. I mean, I, I think this question is a, probably a little bit premature. Uh, I think uh, for most people right now, it's, you know, you kind of have to seek it out. Uh, if you want to earn Bitcoin, you have to uh, maybe, you know, you find a job that, that your boss loves Bitcoin, right? And you ask them to pay you in it. But I think going forward, uh, when you start to look at like a five-year, 10-year timeline, uh, the majority of people who the way they get Bitcoin is going to be because they work and they get paid in money and that money is going to be Bitcoin. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And I think for many people, the easy, simple way is to simply buy Bitcoin. Um, but there may be people who are able to charge for their services and denominate or 
it might be denominated in fiat. It might be like, oh, pay me a thousand dollars, but pay me in a thousand US dollars to this Bitcoin address. And we'll, we'll get into some of that aspect of it as well. Um, and I think probably the other way is potentially mining Bitcoin. Now, this can be a, a bit of a tricky rabbit hole for people and maybe it might not be the best option for people when they're just getting started. But how would you um, put that for people when they're new? Should they, you know, because people might have heard, oh, I should mine Bitcoin. Should, should they be, should the average person be doing that? Or what do you, how do you guys think about that? I, I think that um, the average person ought to, ought to come up with a, a Bitcoin uh, application or Bitcoin acquisition uh, service provider that they're comfortable with. And then they ought to think Bitcoin is like a long-term savings account. And when they get a bonus or they get some money that they can afford to put away and save, for the long period, they should convert it to Bitcoin, just dollar cost averaging in, not really getting stressed out over timing the market. If someone pays you in dollars and you don't need the money now, you convert to Bitcoin. I think that's a good idea. Um, I think that Bitcoin mining is a different business. If you're a Bitcoin miner or ready to be a Bitcoin miner, you know it, but probably the, the normal person isn't. I think in terms of getting paid in Bitcoin, if you have a, you know, you could ask someone to pay you in Bitcoin, it would be the tax efficient way for them to do it would be if you told me to pay you in Bitcoin, I would go on Square or go on some app, I would buy the Bitcoin today and then I would transfer it to you today before the price changes so I don't have to file it with my accountant and, and attribute a loss or a gain to it. So generally, if you're getting paid in Bitcoin, someone's going to be buying it and transferring to you. But if you got to keep in mind that if they could do that, you also have the power just to take delivery and take the pay in dollars or any currency. And then you just convert to Bitcoin upon receipt. Probably the big takeaway here is, you know, Bitcoin's an asset and it's, it's treated as property for tax treatment. It's not treated as currency. And what that means is you generally want to buy it and hold it for long periods of time because every time you transfer it or you sell it, you incur a capital gains tax or some kind of tax. And that's very inefficient. It's just a bad idea. So, so the longer you can hold it, the better. And uh, anyway, you know, probably the single most important thing to do is convert as much of your discretionary income as you can afford to save into Bitcoin as soon as you can, because it is an appreciating asset over long periods of time. But, uh, but don't do so much that it just stresses you out and you can't sleep at night. Yeah, I love that. That's really great. Those are some really great tips for people who are new to Bitcoin. Um, and it might also be useful as well if you guys have any tips on how to select a reputable exchange or business or broker service to uh, to do this, to purchase Bitcoin with. Do you have any tips on that? Matt? Um, I mean, before we get there, I just wanted to add that, uh, I mean, Michael made a very good point, right? If, if you're going to get paid in Bitcoin, it's probably because your boss already has a surplus of Bitcoin and he wants to pay you in Bitcoin. Otherwise... You're just, you're just creating more headache for that person and you're better off just accepting your fiat payment and then just dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin yourself. Um, on the mining side, it should be, for some reason, beginners all want to mine Bitcoin. They, like the first thing they want to do is mine Bitcoin. And really it should be thought of as more of an advanced type of acquisition strategy. Um, it is completely dominated by professionals. But there is some argument to be made that if you're a hobbyist and you want to mine, you do so because it's the most private way of acquiring Bitcoin. You plug it in, you, you plug this device into, into the internet, you plug it into power, and it's just producing a constant flow of Bitcoin for you um, without you having to like go to a centralized third party, which we're about to discuss, to go and buy your Bitcoin. And, and when you have to go to those centralized third parties, you have to you know, give them all your identification information, all this other stuff that, that we've gotten used to doing with the regular banking system. Same thing applies here. Um, so when it comes time to like, actually finding a reputable exchange uh, or service to, to actually buy your Bitcoin, um, that isn't that easy of a question. I mean, Stefan, you know as well as anyone else uh, that there's been a ton of, of pitfalls and, and issues with service providers in the space. Uh, usually in the beginning, what, you know, 
I, I think a very common sense move is to go to the more reputable, larger ones, um, at least to get your feet wet in the beginning, because a general rule of thumb is the larger the service is, the, the longer they've been going on, the, the better reputation they have, um, the less likely it is that they're going to either lose your money or lose your personal information, which are like the two most valuable things that you're trusting that, that company with. Because I mean, most of these services, if you use a service like Cash App, or if you use a service like River in the United States, um, the you you you're you're doing a bank transfer, so you're trusting them with your your private bank account information. You're trusting them with all this I- identification information. Uh, so you it, it's it's very important that you pick a reputable one. Excellent, and also let's talk a little bit about uh, Bitcoin wallets and ways of storing our Bitcoin. So uh, maybe if Michael, you want to just chat a little bit about how you think about that and how, how should the new Bitcoin pers- new Bitcoiner think about, you know, learning to do that process of storing their Bitcoins. And if there are any particular wallets or any particular, I guess these, this moves and changes over time, but at least as that, you know, current day, what's the current uh, situation there? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of choices, right? Ranging from mobile payment applications that are that have open wallets to to uh, wallets uh, that come with the exchanges that may be multi-factor i mean that could require ub keys to you know to hardware wallets that are more secure and then there's downloadable mobile wallets that some support lightning and some don't and there's like a host of them like blue and moon and and the like, and they all have various pros and cons to them. I don't think I could give a single recommendation to anybody. I think that as people get more security conscious, they they tend to move toward hardware wallets with multi-signature, multi-factor authentication, but it all depends upon how much Bitcoin you've got and also where you are. And also, are you a business or are you an individual? And, and maybe you have some other personal issues. What's your transaction frequency going to be? Matt, my Yeah, those are all important considerations. Um, and I know, Michael, we've only got you for a short period of time. So maybe one more question just for you. For new Bitcoiners, how should they think about their you know, accumulation? Uh, and why is it important that they are you know, setting up that regular accumulation strategy? Why is that an important thing for them uh, when they're just getting started and learning about Bitcoin? Well, I think in our current monetary environment, you could reasonably expect that the economic energy in any currency in the world is going to lose 1% of its value every month. And in a weaker weaker currency, you would lose 2% of your value a month. And so if you're saving your money in a currency, then the clock is ticking and you're losing your savings. If you're saving your money in bonds, it's no better. You're still kind of losing your savings about the same rate. If you're saving your money in a stock or a stock index, generally at least half of the value of the stock, if not more, is is based upon the cash flows, which means that a lot of value stocks will just look like bonds. They look like currency derivatives. So a large number of things that you could hold with your life savings are exposed to currency debasement. And so it's important that in a weakening currency, you in a disciplined fashion be converting your economic wealth over into an deflationary asset that's not going to be debased, that won't be inflated away, and that presumably will appreciate in value faster than the rate of the currency expansion. So So Bitcoin is kind of that engineered savings account in cyberspace. Um, If you hold 90% of your money in the other savings account and the currency loses lots of its value, then your life savings is just uh, leaking away. Um, So I, I think discipline with regard to where you store your wealth is kind of critical. And you might think you have a bit of time, but, uh, but the problem is that, you know, the weeks fly by and the months go by and at a, at a 15% and monetary inflation rate, that means that uh, you're going to lose half of your money within about four years. And so 
it, it goes fast. So that's, I, I think the good discipline there is helpful. Just uh, be protecting yourself financially. Yeah. And I think that's the important part. It's the why it's like, yeah, you have to pull all the pieces together and pull it together into a thesis and think, okay, this is the situation we're in. This is the reaction. I need to save my wealth into something that is going to actually preserve it for the long term. So Matt, do you have anything to add on that point? No, I mean, Michael just nailed it there. So yeah, hundred percent agree. <laughs> I guess what exactly. we can say is that if you're in the U S and Europe and you're in a strong currency, that's, that's kind of pegged to the dollar. We kind of think that that's weakening 15% a year, maybe more, but like 15% a year, a little bit more than 1% a month. But if you're in a currency that's weaker, that is weakening against the dollar, certain currencies, you know, in the, you know, the second tier, they're weakening 20% faster. And the third tier currencies are weakening two to three times faster. If you think that that the currency that you're working in is weakening even weakening against the dollar, like you can see this in Turkey, you can see this in Lebanon, you can see this in certain other countries, you know, Nigeria, you should scramble harder, <laughs> right? You would probably, you don't really necessarily, the, the risk of, of not doing anything is higher than the risk of doing something and so there becomes a point where, where I would say people ought to move fairly aggressively to at least get their money out of the weak currency. You got to judge how much you trust that currency in your given country, wherever you might be. Yeah, so it's for everyone to make their own assessment. How, you know, how urgently do they need to be running to Bitcoin? Um, but I think for many of us in the Bitcoin world, we have been quite public about our advocacy of this as this is a way to save yourself so think about it you have to think about it from that point of view um but as michael points out in the western world it might be let's call it less urgent than if you are in the developing world so there's kind of just a few points around that okay stefan thanks for having me matt mike thank you thanks for joining us i leave everybody on the cast in good hands take care and all the best Thanks, oh, yeah. So, uh, Matt, let's um, go back to you. I think an interesting point for people to think about also is the way uh, they acquire Bitcoin. They might want to think about using about doing that in a more private way. So why is that important? Why should they think about that aspect of Bitcoin? I mean, Michael just uh, his last comment made me think of something just to go back uh, in terms of earning Bitcoin today. Right. If you're in one of those um economies that's that's doing worse that has a worse currency and and your job is a a digital job where you have like maybe you have uh, clients that are located in the western world the client that's located in the united states for instance uh it might be easier in that situation for you to actually get paid in bitcoin and have them convert on their side even if they don't have bitcoin right um so i think that's like a that that's something that we forget about um a lot but, but if, you're, if you're purely a digital contractor um, and not only are you dealing with these, this poor currency at home, you also have to deal with like all the foreign transaction fees and whatnot in terms of them transferring it to you. So in that case, the argument to be paid directly in Bitcoin today becomes way stronger. And I, I could even see, um, and, and a way to encourage that basically, let's say you're just a contractor, you know, you're, your client doesn't want to pay you in Bitcoin, but you tell them, you know, I'll give you a 15% discount if, if you go and convert it to Bitcoin before you pay me. Right. And it might seem like that's a big discount, but the reality is for you, you might be saving a lot of value in that. And I know even in this case where if you are in a more developing world market, there may be times where there is a premium in the local peer to peer Bitcoin market there. So as an example, let's say Matt O'Dell is a contractor in you know, one of these countries and he asks me for payment and I pay him in Bitcoin and then he can turn around and if he needs fiat to buy it, you know, living expenses and food and so on, he can then turn around and sell some of that, some of that Bitcoin on the peer-to-peer markets in his local country where there may be, who knows, 5%, maybe even 10% or maybe even more of a premium. So he's actually getting like sort of getting a premium back when he sells on those local exchanges. That's very much a possibility. So that's another aspect. Um, and then 
Yeah. So for those people who are interested to acquire Bitcoin privately, why should they think about that? And what are some of the ways to start going about that aspect for people interested in that? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that Bitcoin, a lot of us, I think, tend to agree that Bitcoin is is an insurance. It's, a, it's like almost an insurance policy against uh, poor governance. Uh, you know, our governments are in charge of our money historically. Um, and if you don't trust your government with that responsibility, then it's extra important that you have a independent money um, that is out of their control, that they can't corrupt. Um, now, there's two issues with that, you know, especially if you have a, a particularly bad government, um, is they could, if you don't take custody of your Bitcoin yourself and you leave it with one of these centralized services, um, the government, your government can go to that centralized service and they can seize your Bitcoin. Um, they could freeze your Bitcoin. They could say you're not allowed to withdraw it at that point. Um, so that's why it's extra important to actually take custody of it yourself. Um, the second thing is do you, you have transaction records with that entity. Um, we could see situations, I would not be surprised if we see situations around the world where you have authoritarian governments come in, seize those records, and then start targeting large holders of Bitcoin. They'll, they'll know you have Bitcoin and they'll come looking for you. Now, that's obviously way more difficult. They have to go you know, door to door, person to person, uh, rather than going directly to an entity. But it it's still should be a concern. Third, you can have, you know, in the, in the, our world is ever more digital every, every day. And we see larger and larger database hacks and leaks, right? Where, where these, these large databases are compromised and they're sold on, on the dark web um, and they're, they're shared and they're, they're, com they're combined with other leaks, right? So if you have a leak from one spot and you have a leak from another spot, they can be combined to have even more information on you. And in that situation, especially in crime ridden parts of the world, you can have you know, organized crime, malicious individuals can get access to that and they can use that data to target large holders once again, right? And what, a, what is a large holder? It depends where you live, right? In some places in the world, you know, a, people might, might think it's a small amount in, in America or in Australia, but in that part of the world, they'll, they'll come after you for it. So how do you protect yourself? You protect yourself by using Bitcoin more privately acquiring it more privately and actually using it more privately. And that's easier said than done. I don't know if that's, you know, for a beginner course, I think, I think what people should know is that when you use Bitcoin with these centralized entities and when you use Bitcoin uh, at a basic level, you are leaking transaction information, you're leaking private information and you need to educate yourself. So I don't want people to be overwhelmed in the beginning. I think, you know, you use one of these reputable services, you, you withdraw to a mobile wallet. Uh, Michael mentioned a couple, I, a Moon wallet I really like now, M-U-U-N wallet. Um, you play around with it, you get used to it, and then start going down that rabbit hole, start educating yourself on how to use it more privately, how to acquire it more privately. Yeah, that's a great way to balance that. So Moon Wallet for people who are new, the website for that M-U-U-N.com. And that is an Apple or Android app. So you can, it's just an easy phone wallet. Now, the thing is in this space, things move quickly. So often recommendations will change, but I think where we stand right now, I think Moon is a good first choice. Another one is Phoenix Wallet and another one is Breeze, B-R-E-E-Z, Breeze. So those are some great, easy solutions for those of you who are looking to get started with self-custody. And now one way to, I guess, there's a few different nuances here. So depending on what you are planning to use Bitcoin for, that will sort of push you down different pathways in terms of what you are going to which wallet you are going to use. But I guess high level, there's a progression step here. So I would generally say first step is hard, is a, sorry, a phone wallet like Moon Wallet. Then probably the next level when you're ready is a hardware wallet. And then think of it like this is like a more advanced level is probably multi-signature. But 
even inside the multi-signature, there's different options there. You can go for like a guided provider, like a CASA or an unchanged capital where they help you, or you can do it as, as your own setup. But I think that's just high level. So if you're new and you're trying to think about how do I, you know, think about how do I sort of go through a progression steps, start with a phone wallet and then think about a hardware wallet. Uh, Matt, do you have any tips to add on, on that aspect, the progression? Yeah, I think I, that progression, you, you pretty much nailed it. Um, I, uh, a hardware wallet is like a, is, is a, is a specific device. You can think of it like almost like a USB stick, um, that is designed to hold your Bitcoin. Yeah, there you go. Here's one just as an example for anyone, this is called a cold card. So this is a very well-known hardware wallet amongst Bitcoin people. Matt, go on. Yeah. So the cold card is, is arguably considered the, the best, the best hardware wallet in the space. I think me and Stefan both agree that we like it the most. Um, there's really like, don't go down like the, there, there's only like a couple reputable ones. Like you, you don't want to use some completely unknown hardware wallet. Uh, don't get like cheeky with it. It's like cold card ledger and treasure are like, basically like if you're coming in that that's what you want to do. And the only reason I would say not to use the cold card as your first one is because, um, you want to you want to use altcoins and the other two support altcoins, but I mean I think me and Stefan think that you should just focus on Bitcoin. Um, so that's not really a good argument in my opinion. The second thing is I just I don't want people I don't think you should get overwhelmed. The most important part is that for, is is to get comfortable. You have to get comfortable with these things. You can't you can't just it's Bitcoin is about personal responsibility. It's 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 money for people who want to take personal responsibility of their finances. So personal responsibility will always be the more difficult option. There's no such thing as set and forget. You have to, you have to use these things. You have to get comfortable with these things and you literally never going to stop learning. You have to just constantly improve. Um, and the space evolves all the time and the attackers evolve all the time. And you just, you just need to keep on, you know, you got to you got to keep putting effort in and and improving your setup. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And so the way to think about it is you just need to progress. And I understand for people who are new, you might be thinking, "Whoa, like there's a lot I need to learn." But unfortunately, that's the that's the reality of Bitcoin as it is today. You can think of it like it's very it's very highly rewarding though to learn about Bitcoin. And so that's what I've found from many of my friends and people who I've been teaching about Bitcoin. They found, yeah, there's a lot to learn, but hey, it was worth it. So just think of it like that. That I understand it can be confronting at the start when you are new and there's all these words and technical terms and things. But I think it's just the, the suggestion I would have for you is to keep it basic and just take one step at a time. So don't, don't think of it like you have to go zero to hero straight away. That's not what any of us are expecting. The point is just to get started, even if it's imperfectly, just get started and then learn from that. Yeah. I mean, um, not only are we not yeah. expecting you to go zero to hero, like you're not going to be able to. And, and one of the things about Bitcoin is, is there's, there's no one size fits all approach because it is an open system. Um, it's an open network. There's a lot of different ways you can use it with a lot of different tools. Um, that's what makes it you know, so powerful and so robust, but it's also what makes it a little bit harder to come in in the beginning. And it is what it is. That's just, that's the reality of the situation. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the practicalities of setting up a Bitcoin wallet and then withdrawing from the exchange, right? So different wallets will have different setup processes. Some of them will involve you writing down a backup. Now, in the case of Moon Wallet, it's a little bit of a different backup process, but essentially you go through the backup and you write that down and you keep that safe. Um, in other cases, like a hardware wallet, you will have typically a, either a 12 or 24 word seed. And that is very important. So when you back that up, you need to, you need to write that down in a place that's quiet and ideally there's no you know, um, microphones and other things around. And it's not like you're in a cafe, you do it at home in a quiet you know, room. And you write down those 12 or 24 words. And those, that is known colloquially as your seed words, or it's also called your recovery phrase. And so anyone who gets that can steal your Bitcoin. Okay. And I know that's a little bit confronting, but there are you know, security techniques that we can apply on top of that. But when you're getting started, uh, that's an important thing. Don't, and some tips, don't take a photo of it. Don't tell anyone your seed words. You, know, you write them down and then ideally 
you can back them up onto a onto a metal backup seed. Uh, but think of it like this 12 or 24 words, if you were to lose your hardware wallet, you could recover with those 12 or 24 words. And here's the interesting thing for new people, that 12 or 24 words is not just your backup now, it's your backup for all future transactions on that wallet. And I understand that's a little bit trippy, that's a little bit kind of crazy to think about, but that's really the truth of it. Um, so yeah, so essentially when you create your wallet, you can then withdraw from the exchange. Now, Matt, can you give any give us any tips? What does that look like, and how should we think about that? Um, just to just just to extend what you just said, uh, you know, with Bitcoin, there's no centralized company that runs Bitcoin. It's a it's an you know it's an open network uh, that that is not controlled by any individual or corporation. So there's no. So there's no forgot password button. You have to, you, you have to, you know, take care of your own backup yourself and you have to store it securely offline. And if anyone has access to that backup, uh, they're going to be able to spend your funds. And as long as you have that backup, you're going to always be able to recover your funds, no matter what happens with your, the specific wallet you show uh, you use. So like, for instance, we, you know, Stefan showed earlier, the cold card wallet, this hardware wallet, What's really cool is you have that backup offline. Um, in this case, it's you know a word phrase, and you you either write that, that down on a piece of paper, you put it in steel, but you keep it offline. You never put it on on a computer. The cool part is if cold card goes out of business, you can still recover it. You can recover it with another with another application, another wallet, and that's the beauty of this open standard, right? Because uh, you don't have to rely on an individual company. Uh, to basically give you access to your funds. But that comes with the negative that there is no forgot password button. There's no customer support you can call to restore your funds. Uh, and that just goes, one, it goes back to what we said earlier where you know this is about personal responsibility and it'll always be the more difficult option. Um, to, to answer your question, which was what do we do about actually pulling it off of exchange? Um, an exchange is gonna give you basically a field and you're gonna put in your Bitcoin address which your wallet is going to provide you. That Bitcoin address looks like a bunch of random letters and numbers. Uh, it usually will now start with BC. BC1 is what the address should look like if it's a new address type, or it'll start with a one or a three. And it just looks like a random letters and numbers. And you basically want to confirm on your wallet that it's the same exact, it's the, you want to make sure it's the same address you put in and it'll show up on, on your side once you click uh, withdraw. And just do that with like a small amount and get used to it, see it there, then transfer it around, maybe delete your wallet, then restore it with your backup, do all these things with a small amount so you can get comfortable with it. Yeah, excellent. And so what we can do then is people can, you know, practice withdrawing with a small amount from their exchange into their wallet. Now, as we mentioned, you can do that with Moon Wallet. So let's say you're just getting started and you just have a phone wallet. Well, you can copy paste that Bitcoin receipt. So in your wallet, you'll on your phone, you'll go to receive. It will generate a, a Bitcoin address. And then when you copy paste that into your exchange or broker or service, and they will pay you out to that address. So think of it like this is an address that you control. If any Bitcoins hit that address, they're now yours, if you will. That's one way to think about it. And now if you are, I guess, some of the different questions. Oh, we've got a question here. Are Bitcoin addresses case sensitive? So no. Um, so I think in the BC1, so in the native SegWit or the BESH32 encoded addresses, they are either all lowercase or all uppercase. And they, they don't do mixed case in the BC1 address type case. Um, so generally speaking, you don't have to worry about that part. Now, for some of you, if you are operating in a world where, let's say we're doing smaller transactions, you might be doing what's called lightning transactions. Now, some exchanges are starting to support this and they're starting to support the way of doing withdrawal using lightning. So a couple of examples here. I know um, Bitaroo here in Australia support lightning. I know Kraken are supporting. I know OKCoin are supporting lightning. And so for those of you, and Bitfinex is also famously another one who supports lightning. So if you are on a wallet and you need to withdraw in lightning, 
then you actually, it's a slightly different process. You would go to receive and then go to lightning and then you would have what's called a lightning invoice. So it might say something like LN, BC, and then a whole bunch of numbers and characters. And so basically same, same idea. You would then copy paste that lightning invoice into your exchanges withdrawal field and then withdraw into lightning. So that's a few tips around that. And uh, how should we think about uh, this question I guess, depending on the different levels, because if somebody is coming in and they're only buying $100, maybe that's that should be done with Lightning. Whereas if they're buying $1,000, then they're probably going to be withdrawing that on chain, right? Well, depending when they're watching this video, uh, they might be withdrawing to Lightning with a higher amount. Um, so uh, there's a question in the chat, why are BC1 addresses preferred? And I think it goes hand in hand with this question. Um, BC1 addresses, or, and, and just to extend what Stefan was saying, like, as far as case sensitive goes, you just copy and paste the address. You know, you're not typing these things in manually, okay? And, and if, if the, the, ca the caps or not caps isn't gonna change anything for you, don't get overwhelmed by that aspect of it. Um, so there's three address types on Bitcoin and then there's lightning. The three address types are start with one, then three, and then BC one, these all came in chronological order. The BC ones are the newest ones. You pay the least fees with them. Then with the three addresses, you pay the next least. And then with the one addresses, you're gonna pay the most in fees. So you wanna use the BC ones because you're gonna pay less in fees. Now Lightning, you'll pay even less in fees. With Lightning though, there's a, there's a, there's a second piece of nuance there that makes it different from the regular addresses. Those regular addresses, once you generate an address, you for privacy reasons, you shouldn't reuse it, but you can reuse it. This is something Stefan said earlier. Like if all your old addresses will always be good. So if you give a friend or a client or something an address and then your wallet keeps generating new addresses, you don't have to worry if they accidentally send to the old address. You still get those funds. With Lightning, you have to copy and paste this invoice, which is even a longer string of letters and numbers than the address. Every time you have to copy a new one into who's ever paying you whether that's you're sending it to them via WhatsApp or, or Signal, or if you're just putting it in an exchange, you're going to have to give it to them every time. Um, but the benefit there is you're going to end up paying significantly less fees, especially for smaller amounts. On on-chain, so on-chain, the, the regular Bitcoin addresses, 1, 3, BC1, the way you pay transaction fees are actually the amount of data that's being sent, not the amount of money you send. So if you send a payment that's $10, or a payment that's a million dollars, you're gonna pay the same absolute fee. So what that means is your fee per, as a percentage for that $10 payment is gonna be significantly higher than if you send a million dollars. But on Lightning, the fee scales with the payment amount, which is, very, which is way easier to conceptualize. That's like how our modern finance system works, right? So if you send a payment that's $10 or if you send a payment that's a million dollars, it's gonna be 1% of both. Right, so there's a there's a threshold there where the larger amount you send, you'll end up paying less if you use a regular address versus Lightning. But for smaller amounts, you're going to pay significantly less if you use Lightning. Yeah, yeah. So I can understand if you're new. There's a lot of different kind of rabbit holes and things to understand, but sometimes you just have to practice it, and that's how you you get used to these things in practice. But high level, what I would say for you guys out there. If you're doing small value commerce, you need to be using Lightning because otherwise you're going to get eaten alive in fees, all right? Bitcoin on-chain transaction fees can can be high and they are rising. So they, you know, it, I guess earlier this year, normal chain transaction fees might've been $5 per transaction. Uh, and currently we've got a bit of a, a fee spike happening. So they might be 20 or $30. And so if you are operating in a, in a situation where maybe your income is not that high, you need to be using lightning. And so in certain cases, if you're, if we're talking about really low values where you, you, where you cannot even afford the chain fee of a Bitcoin transaction to open your lightning transaction, you may actually have to use a custodial lightning wallet for, for when you're getting started. And so an example here might be like blue wallet. Like if you're in a situation where you only earn 200 or $300 and you can't afford to pay that, you know, on-chain fee. Um, but I guess th there's a few different kind of nuances there. But just remember that we we always have this ethos in the Bitcoin world of not your keys, not your coins. So when as soon as you're able to learn and you're practically able to use, you know, self-sovereign, uh, self-custodied Bitcoin wallets, we encourage you to do that. 
Um, but just to recognize some of you out there might not be in a situation where you can uh, afford that. Um, so, and also um, we got a question in the chat here. What are the best locations for backup words, hidden or safe deposit box? Uh, so Matt, do you have any tips for listeners out there? I do, but before I do, yep. uh, the one of the reasons why we mentioned Moon Wallet earlier, M-U-U-N Wallet, that's on, on the phone, uh, is because it supports both the regular addresses and it supports Lightning. And it does so in a non-custodial way. Uh, so you can experiment with both right there in the wallet on your mobile phone. And then the other two we mentioned, Breeze and Phoenix, are Lightning only in a non-custodial way. So, so we're already we're seeing this move where the majority of transactions are going to be happening on lightning and the easiest way for a user to interact with that is going to be through mobile wallets and that's why those are the ones that i recommend that you start off with to begin with now where do we where do we keep our secret where do we keep those secret words or backup words um someone in the chat mentioned multiple places multiple places is a is just a great simple rule of a rule of thumb and the reason is is because the majority of times people lose bitcoin it's because they messed it up themselves. They lose their own backup. And Bitcoin for the first time ever provides us the ability to keep copies in different places. Like you can't keep copies of your gold in different places, but you can keep copies of your Bitcoin keys in different places. You know, maybe you keep it in your office, maybe you keep it in your house and the house burns down, you still have the copy in the office. So it's nice to have redundancy. The negative there is if you have redundancy, you also, from an attack point of view, someone might is more likely to find it. If you keep six or seven copies of it, and you know, then it's six or seven more times that they can find it. And if they find it, then they can spend your Bitcoin. So strictly speaking, I don't like safe deposit boxes. Safe deposit boxes are located in banks. They have long histories of, of being opened without permission. Uh, contents get lost sometimes. You have to go through like a bunch of different cameras and stuff just to access your own Bitcoin. It's kind of old world thinking, and I think it's more harm than good. The cool thing about Bitcoin backups in this, in this method is their words. It's just a word phrase. So there's a lot of ways you can be creative about where you keep it. You know, like you, there, there's, there, and steel, we talked about steel. Steel is fantastic because it's naturally fire and water resistant. So these are things you want to think about. But, you know, don't tell people where you keep it. There's no one size fits all approach, but I would strictly, I don't like safe deposit boxes. I think they're over recommended and people should be cautious about them. Yeah, I guess that's a, it's a very contextual thing because it might be, it might be the, the case that it works in a multi-signature context where you're keeping one key out of your quorum in a safety deposit box, but that's a multi-signature is a bit more advanced. So I think we'll probably consider that out of scope for this beginner session. Um, but that is something that you guys out there, you can think about when you're in a multi-signature context. Um, but essentially think about your backups and you want to test your backups as well to make sure that they actually really do work. And so it's, it's a challenging thing in the Bitcoin world because there's always competing priorities. As an example, we also have to always think about inheritance, right? We will not live forever. So we are going to have to pass our Bitcoins on to our children someday or to our heirs, whoever we want to pass it on to. So we have to think about how are they going to be able to access the Bitcoins? So think about that aspect of it also that, you know, maybe you keep as an example, you might, you know, have your cold card with your 24 words and you might put that into a steel backup product that backs up those 24 words in steel. So that way it's fireproof. And you might think of it if you have, you know, somewhere secret that you can put that but then you might also have to make sure your family knows where to find that. If something happens to you, they would know where to get it. That's probably one way to think about it. Yeah, I think that's a very good point about inheritance. Uh, you know, especially when you hear Michael Saylor talk and you're talking about generational, generational money, right? You're talking about money that's going to be around for a long time and you want to be able to pass that on. And this is a world of personal responsibility. So you can't just count on like, you know, you're, you're, you're a lawyer or someone to pass it along in a will. You're going to have to actually figure out a process that's safe for yourself. And, and one intricacy to think about with Bitcoin is because this is all that's needed to spend. You end up in a situation where you might be trusting your heir with information that they could either, they could either take the money from you um, or they become vulnerable. So if, if um, 
I mean, a, a simple thing to think is like, oh, like you tell your mother about it and like she puts it on a post-it and like sticks it on her computer screen. She doesn't even mean to, right? But like a maid comes in or something and, and, sees, and sees the backup because she didn't take care of it carefully enough, right? Um, so these, these little nuances, including where do you store it, are simply put, you know, pretty much solved with multisig. And this is why a lot of us say the end of the road ends up at multisig because you can devise situations. Multisig is this idea where instead of having one secret, you have a threshold of secrets. Let's say you have five secrets and you need three of the five to spend. So you can put them in different locations. You can have it so a family member can access two of them, but you have a lawyer that can only access one. And like, if, if, if something happens to you, they have to come together to spend the money. They can't individually spend the money. The lawyer can't take your money. The, the heirs can't take your money, but this is more advanced stuff. So I think the key is you, you just want to, you want to start small. You want to get comfortable and then slowly start working through these scenarios as you have more and more money in Bitcoin um, and level yourself up. But the, the number one mistake people make is they rush into advanced setups too quickly and lose their own money. They, they shoot themselves in the foot. So I don't, I don't want people to, um, you know, get too aggressive with it early on. You got to just keep using it and keep learning. Yeah. And that's a great point. I think it's a common, <clears throat> a common thing is that a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot because they're using a, a setup that's too complex or it's not, you know, an open source, well-tested by the community, well-known setup. And then, it, then if their heirs have trouble recovering those coins then they're in real trouble because now, you know, it's, it's, you know, or they've lost the coins because they've lost a way to access the private keys that are to be able to spend those coins. So let's talk a little bit about scams and pitfalls in the space. There are many of them. And so I think it's just good for newcomers to get some idea. And of course the scams are constantly evolving, right? So we could tell you some stuff that's applicable now in April, 2021. And in, you know, just a few months time, the scams will evolve and they'll be different. But let's, let's just try and give you guys a few basics to sort of know, oh, that's a pitfall. I need to avoid that. Okay. So uh, Matt, do you want to start? Do you have any common scams or pitfalls in the space that you want to make sure people are aware of? The number one thing, and this is going to be a timeless scam. This is something that'll be around no matter when you watch this video is never, never trust someone with those, those backups. You know, like if, if you're talking to a customer, if someone you think is a customer support person or a friend that wants to help you, you cannot give anyone those backups. Uh, then they can spend your money. It is very common. They'll say sometimes, sometimes it'll be uh, like an active person. So like they, they've been working you for a while and then they'll take it from you. Other times, which is even more common, is they get your email or your phone number or your Twitter account. And they, they know that you are interested in Bitcoin, probably because of a database leak, as we spoke about earlier. And they'll send you a, a link. Oh, uh, your wallet is compromised. Click this link to fix it. And then you click the link and it's like, okay, enter your words. And then you enter your backup and then they take your money. So never do that. So ne and if you ever get freaked out, just take a deep breath, walk away from the computer, you know, sleep on it. Like nothing, nothing's going to happen in the meantime. Don't, uh, don't do that. The second big thing we see is get rich quick. So send me Bitcoin and I will send you two, two times that amount. Or I have a great investment strategy for you that gives you guaranteed money. You just have to send me some Bitcoin and you'll get it in a couple months or whatever. Pretty much always a scam. Uh, so just as Michael said earlier, I, I mean, I'm like a broken record on this uh, is just you just slow and steady, just constantly accumulating Bitcoin, stacking stats, and just and, and just saving, saving and saving in Bitcoin. Don't don't uh, don't get cheeky with it. You know, don't think that you need to. Uh, everyone thinks they're late when they come in and they're in a rush to try and catch up, and that's usually where you get burned. Yeah, very good point there. And so some people get caught up in schemes where they think oh look i'm going to become a trader and if you are not professionally a trader and don't forget even lots of professional traders lose money so the reality is it's probably only the top one percent of traders who actually make money right so unless you think 
you are going to be that one percent and obviously sometimes people come into this with like some irrational confidence they come in and some person tells them oh look look at this trading course if you if you follow me and my recommendations you can blah 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 and the reality is a lot of people end up losing money because they think they're going to be that one percent but the reality is they're more like the 99 percent who lose money while trading so the safe strategy really is to just accumulate bitcoin just steady savings every week or every day or however however much you can afford to save for the long term you just stack those sats be very wary of anyone who's promising you quick get rich get rich quick schemes because they can often be like a and sometimes there are different it presents itself in different ways they might do like a mining scam they might say hey send me some money and it's a mine you you're earning all this money from mining or it's um oh hey i've got a trading bot send me some bitcoin and i'll do the trading for you and then how they get you is because they're pulling on that dread string they know that people want to make money and so they'll promise this unrealistic outlandish return and as you know this is like a time honored rule if it sounds too good to be true it probably is so just be wary of that um that's always a difficult and, yeah. one or it's bitcoin <laughs> yeah bitcoin is is really good it's almost too good to be true but uh <laughs> but it's not um and so um a couple of a couple other tips as well so as you get more advanced on your security journey you want to start really uh yeah make sure you test your backups because sometimes people uh, get into a situation where they have made a backup but it was years ago and they maybe they wrote it down wrong or they you know you just want to make sure you test that backup to give yourself that confidence so some hardware wallets offer that you, but you also want to make sure you're never typing your seed words into the computer so that's also a very important point um, because a common hack or a scam is having some kind of key logging malicious software that is trying to watch for your keyboard and watch what you're typing in and then boom once they get the 24 words boom it's gone so that's another thing just be wary of that um, another tip is if you are using a hardware wallet generally speaking you want to try and use that hardware wallet to make sure the address is correct that you are either receiving into or that you are paying because it's harder to trick the hardware wallet than it is to trick the computer wallet that you are using. Um, as an example, you might be using uh, a software wallet like Electrum or Spectre or Sparrow to interact with your cold card or your other hardware wallet. And so you want to make sure that you're checking the address on the physical cold card or the ledger or the Trezor, not just trusting what's on your computer screen. Um, any other ones, Matt? Yeah, I mean, just to add there, like uh, the whole reason hardware wallets exist is because the average person is completely screwed if they, they can't secure their own computer. We can't secure our own computers. It's, it's not an easy process. So what a hardware wallet is, it's a purpose-built little computer that's, that's designed to do one thing only, and that is just secure that secret, that Bitcoin secret that you have, your private key, that is, is the key to all of your funds. And the, the, the key strategy it uses is all the good ones have a little screen on it. And that little screen will show you your, your address information. And you always want to confirm it on there because, because it's, it's, it's not on, it's not on your computer. So you, you want to actually, you, you have two sources of truth. You have, you have on your computer and you have on your dedicated little hardware wallet and you want them, they, they should both be the same. Otherwise something's wrong and you should just not proceed. Take a step back don't proceed with it. Yeah. And another tip is to try to bias towards open source, well-tested software and hardware within the community. So why is that important? Um, I mean, it's important because two reasons, the software could be malicious. I guess three reasons. The software could be malicious. The software could just be garbage uh, or the software might not be um might not be up to the same standards uh, across the whole space. So if something happens to that software and the software disappears or the wallet disappears, you might not be able to restore it on another device uh, or another wallet. So, so what you really want to do is there's, there's, there's not that many that are very strongly peer reviewed. Um, you know, I'm sure Sailor Academy has lists of, of good ones, I think. Right. And, and Stefan has lists on his own, on his own site and ministry of nodes, which he runs. Um, and, and so you, you really need to cross check that with like different reputable sources and don't trust any specific source and just don't get, 
you know, don't get, don't get cheeky with it. You know, you, you just, you need to pick something that's just reputable and, and long, long standing. Yep. All right. Well, look, we're coming close to the end of time. So uh, probably a good point. We have to uh, wrap up. Um, but Matt, thanks very much for joining us. And of course, uh, listeners out there, if you are new to Bitcoin, Matt is a great guy to follow in the space. I highly recommend you subscribe to his podcast and listen to his shows, which is the Rabbit Hole Recap and uh, Citadel Dispatch. And make sure you follow him online on Twitter. So Matt, where can everyone find you online? Thanks for having me, Stefan. It's uh, been a pleasure. Um, MattOdell.com. And on Twitter, it's Matt underscore Odell. And I will never DM you asking you for money. That's another scam that you should be aware of. Uh, there's a lot of impersonators on the social media networks. Uh, and they'll, they'll pretend to be me, especially since uh, the L's. The L's are easy to fake with ones. And I always joke around that the, the, the single biggest fan of my tweets are all the Stefan uh, impersonators. They love my tweets. They're just constantly retweeting. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, for listeners out there, basically there are a lot of scam bots basically who impersonate well-known Bitcoin people like Matt and me and others. So just be wary. You might think you're talking to us, but you're really talking to a scam bot impersonator. So just be wary about that. Um, and uh, yeah, so listeners, hopefully you have uh, found some value out of this series. Of course, if you are just watching this now and you haven't seen the, the material, go to sailor.org and search Bitcoin. And I think the actual course title is PRDV151. And you can find all the material there. It's free. You can subscribe and just learn at your own pace. And of course, if you want to find me online, you can find me. You can find my details there, stefanlevera.com or um, on Twitter at stefanlevera. And uh, yeah, thanks for having, uh, thanks for following along with us on this journey. And I'll hand it back to Mike from Sailor Academy now. All right. Well, uh, again, thanks everyone uh, for joining us. Um, uh, Matt, thanks for uh, coming on. And of course, Stefan, thanks for leading this whole thing the last, uh, you know, several weeks. Everyone, uh, all the links to everything we've talked about will be in the description below. Um, and again, thanks everyone for joining us.